The only way to remove the stochastic, non-enzymatic forms of damage that occur primarily outside of cells is to replace tissue. So unless we're doing that, we're not really working on extending maximal lifespan. We're working on health as we age or other things like that, which are great because we all want to live longer, uh, even if we don't beat aging. But I think it's clear, or I think we need to be clear about what it is we're addressing, health, or are we really uh, trying to beat aging? Hello, everybody. I'm Nicholas. And I'm Nina. And today we will interview Jean Ebert. Jean is neurogeneticist uh, from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and founder of BE Therapeutics. So, Jean, how are you? Great, thanks for having me. Look forward to chatting with you. Okay, Jean, you uh, wrote a book, a very important book, uh, some years ago, called uh, Replacing Aging. And first of all, I would like to ask you, uh, if uh, since you wrote the book, there is some uh, news, some updates about your, your research? Sure, yeah. I mean, first, I, I wrote the book because I thought there was a gap in the discussions that people are having about how to extend lifespan, human lifespan. And that gap was in thinking about ways of really reversing aging. More and more people are understanding that the approaches that are being taken are not going to have a big effect on extending lifespan. But what will is tissue level replacement, because not only are you uh, replacing the cells, uh, but more importantly, their extracellular environment, where there is very long lived proteins that accumulate damage throughout our lives. And even if you make the cells younger in that environment, they will still behave like old cells because they respond to their uh, environment accordingly. So we really needed to focus on tissue level replacement, I think, uh, if we're really serious about beating aging. So I, you know, I wrote the book uh, three years ago, and since then, I think there is um, more and more individuals interested in extending lifespan that have an appreciation for the need for tissue level replacement. In my work myself, uh, you know, the biggest update is that I've now founded a company that's up and running since uh, last summer. Um, and it's focused on the same thing my lab was focused on, coming up with ways of progressively replacing brain tissue to reverse uh, damage of the brain. Yeah, um, there are other strategies to rejuvenation science or uh, to uh, regenerative medicine. And uh, if those strategies are su successful, even even if they are successful, uh, we could uh, need uh, the, the replacement of some tissues because, for example, um, the Yamanaka genes with partial cellular reprogramming or the use of young exosomes uh, from uh, young animals, uh, even if those strategies work for very old people, uh, maybe people who already is 70 or 80 years old, some uh, tissues uh, could be damaged in a point that uh, even those strategies uh, can't really rejuvenate totally. So I was thinking about the possibility of your strategy being uh, complementary, uh, especially to old people uh, regarding other technologies. So do you, do you think that your technology could be complementary to these other technologies, even if they are successful for rejuvenation. I'm really glad you're bringing this up, Nicholas. Um, it's important to emphasize that partial reprogramming and exosomes won't work to rejuvenate the body. We know this. It might make us a little healthier, increase performance, but it won't affect aging per se. So we might, more of us, you know, ideally, if 
it does have benefits and which are yet to be shown, it will push more of us towards the maximal lifespan while we nevertheless age and hit that precipice at about 100 to 110 years old. Right? The reason is partial reprogramming exosomes were, won't work is exactly as you said, it targets the cells. We know that if we take young cells, young cells have a young epigenome. They have young mitochondria. They have young telomeres. They're young everything. You put them in the, an older animal, right? Normally aged animal, no special damage, just they're old. Um, and those cells behave like old cells. So we know, we already did the experiment with partial reprogramming to show that having younger cells doesn't help. Right? And the reason is, is pretty clear because biochemists have described this damage that starts in our bodies over time as the body is being made. Elastin is a protein that is made as we're developing as a fetus and never gets turned over for our entire lives and starts accumulating damage immediately after it's made. Not in really old people where it continues to occur, but as soon as it's made, these are physical processes. The forms of damage that occur to these long-lived proteins like elastin, certain types of collagen, uh, those are um, damage that occurs in a stochastic way, non-enzymatic. So there's nothing encoded in our genomes that recognizes this damage. In fact, the proteins that normally can turn over some of these, like collagenase, they no longer can uh, recognize or turn over damaged collagen. This is, this is documented. Um, and so changing the genes or the epigenome doesn't affect the accumulation of that damage, which kills us by, you know, 100 years old or 110. So these approaches, exosomes, same thing. It's, you know, again, they might deliver good factors to cells, increase their performance, uh, but, you know, Things like caffeine do that as well. <laughs> so it's not, they, there's no effect on aging for these approaches. The only way to remove this stochastic, non-enzymatic forms of damage that occur primarily outside of cells is to replace tissue. So unless we're doing that, we're not really working on extending maximal lifespan. We're working on health as we age or other things like that, which are great because we all wanna live longer uh, even if we don't beat aging. But I think it's clear, or I think we need to be clear about what it is we're addressing, health, or are we really uh, trying to beat aging? Partial reprogramming could be used in certain regenerative strategies, but it won't uh, in itself reverse aging in any meaning, meaningful way. It won't work uh, if I understood because you put uh you know, young cells in old tissues and the cells be become young, uh, old. Is, is that correct? Yeah, that's sort of uh, supporting evidence for why it won't work. But there's also um, no, it, there's nothing in the way that the body works that says, and what aging is that where this could possibly work because the damage that accumulates um, that ages us is primarily outside of cells. Uh, it's stochastic, complex forms of all sorts of forms of covalent uh, damage, for example, that, that occurs in the long-lived proteins. Um, and there are no enzymes or proteins that recognize that damage that are encoded in our genome um, and that can turn over the damage. And as, as I was saying previously, the few proteases that are encoded in our genome, like collagenases, can't turn over damaged collagen anymore. And this damage accumulates before we're born, it starts accumulating in these proteins. And so changing the genome, the epigenome might change gene expression, but none of those genes can fix or slow that damage, which is a very physical process over time. And so 
we can do whatever we want to the cells and and it's not going to slow aging and so the example of taking young cells putting in in an old body uh just proves the point because those young cells have a young epigenome they have young mitochondria young telomeres young metabolism etc cetera, etc cetera. and you put them in the old environment and they still behave like old cells and if you take cells from an old animal put them in a young environment they behave like young cells um, in fact, you could take neurons out of an old brain and culture them, and they will outlive the animal because they're happier outside of that damaged environment than in it. So it's not the cells, and everybody in the longevity field, except for maybe a very few, are focusing on these cellular processes, and they will not extend human maximal lifespan. So one thing about that, uh, there's a lot of... Um new research regarding exosomes or extra, extracellular vesicles that uh, I think they explain this like putting a young cell in an old environment and the young cell ages that that could be because of signaling from uh, extracellular vesicles uh, that make the cell behave as old those research usually uh, they talk about a programmed aging that uh, the the body that is not stochastic as you say that there is like a signaling that goes through the whole body and a lot of people talk about also the hypothalamus the hypothalamus that the hypothalamus may be the the, the central uh, control of aging in the body and as you work with the brain <laughs> Uh, maybe uh, could you give us a bit of your opinion about those two things, about the, the, whole, the role of the hypothalamus on aging, and if you also think that these, uh, these effects of putting young uh, tissue into old animal and, and the other way around, and they behave as the, the environment, if this is, can also be due to some, type, some kind of signaling, uh, maybe from the hypothalamus or extracellular vesicles. Yeah, so exosomes, you know, again, there's no mechanism. They, they might provide younger forms of signaling to cells, and that will boost the performance of cells transiently. So if you're measuring aspects of, of cell metabolism, they will look younger in what they're doing. Maybe, that may be true for partial reprogramming as well. But that does not change or slow down the fact that the body is still aging and will still hit a precipice at like 100 or 110 years old. And so rejuvenation is a word that is used very loosely to mean anything that, you know, you're performing more like a younger person. In terms of aging being a programmed process, uh, it depends how you define program. Clearly, you know, there's uh, genetically encoded uh, species lifespans, um, and, and that's, you know, within our genes. But for aging to be programmed in the sense that it was selected for by evolution, that doesn't make sense because there was never an opportunity to do that because people died when they were 30 on average previously. Um, so to, there's no selection pressure to encode anything beyond those ages, whether it's increased lifespan or a program to cause aging. So in that sense, uh, programmed aging uh, doesn't seem possible. Um, but overall, in a genetic sense, um, yes, each species is built genetically to survive, you know, a defined amount of time. Yeah, and um, do you think uh, the hypothalamus may have like a some kind of influence on aging, you know? I'm sure it does, like every other part of your body does too. The heart, the liver, the kidneys, you know, every part of the brain uh, ages. Every part of your body ages, and so the signaling from those parts of the body changes. There's, you know, as this damage accumulates in the extracellular environment, all the cells are like getting inflamed because you know there's they're responding the way they're supposed to to damage 
Um, it's just in this case, it's not damage from injury, it's just damage accumulation slowly over time. So some cells become chronically uh, inflamed, but they're doing what they're supposed to do, sounding the alarm when the environment is not right. Uh, okay, so uh, now we talked about what, uh, why other strategies won't work, but now uh, let's talk about your strategy because uh, with this new new company, you seems to be, you know, advancing uh, towards, um, you know, proportionate this to the public. Uh, first, you know, in the academia, you you continue in the academia, of course, but you are also on a company. Can you tell us, tell us a bit about what is the strategy of your company and the timelines that are so important? For for everybody. Yeah, so let's focus on the brain. The body is, replacement for the body, I think, is um, can be achieved more easily in our lifetime. Um, I think um, people are working on that, and um, I think we'll get there. The brain is a lot more challenging. What we're trying to do is a lot more challenging. We really need to focus on the brain and being able to reverse uh, brain aging. So. That's what we're working on uh, in the lab. That's what the company's working on. We have a timeline to the clinic of um, five to 10 years for stroke. That's our first clinical indication to show that we can replace damaged tissue. So we can't start with aging because it's, uh, you know, the whole brain is, is damaged at that point and it's um, uh, more challenging. So we need to take a more localized approach and, and target stroke. So our timeline, you know, if the company keeps doing well, then uh, I think is optimistically reasonable <laughs> to, to, to be in clinic five to 10 years. But that's for one part of the brain, the neocortex, and that's without the technology for progressive tissue replacement for the whole neocortex, which would involve additional technology, which we don't have to invent. We know it exists, but we have to adapt it to be able to use it for progressive brain tissue replacement. So, so for example, if somebody had a stroke, for example, my grandmother had a stroke and despite she was alive, she was very limited both physically as uh, mentally. So I, your uh, aim is to, for example, for a case like that, you could undo the effects of the stroke in order that the person could be as they were before the stroke? Yeah, so that you're bringing up a very good point. So the, our initial uh, clinical uh, proof of concept is for reacquisition of functions. Um, so when you have a stroke, that information that was encoded in that tissue is gone. Um, and so what the new tissue would allow patients to do at that point is more easily reacquire the tissue because, you know, the tissue we put in is very, very immature, like a, a newborn baby's brain tissue, ready to learn anything. Uh, so it would facilitate reacquisition of the lost function. And, and so there may be some differences compared to how that person was with respect to that function previously. So it's not, wouldn't necessarily be exactly the same because the tissue that encoded that before is gone. For aging uh, or forms of progressive neurodegeneration like aging, but also in certain cases of disease, um, the goal would be to maintain existing functions because we want to preserve our self-identity, our memories, our function. And that we know uh, should be possible as well, uh, even when we remove the old tissue, if we first silence it slowly. So we know in humans, even in their 70s, that have benign gliomas that eat away at the whole frontal lobe, the personality, or the language center, and eventually they get the benign tumor removed surgically. They have a big hole here, but their personality never changed. 
And that's because the tumor grew from a pinpoint out slowly over the course of a couple of years while the person is still using those functions. So they get re-encoded elsewhere. So the strategy for reversing aging versus reversing sudden damage like a stroke is a little different. That's why I said it would take you know another five, 10 years uh, because we have to implement we don't want to use benign tumors to silence areas slowly as the information moves to new tissue. Uh, we want to do it in a way that there's no risk of that benign, benign tumor cells becoming malignant. So we have technology to like optogenetic technology that could potentially be adapted to progressively silencing uh, neocortical areas so that the information is never lost and we maintain our continuity of self during the whole process. Uh, and then the old tissue is removed and we can uh, make space for new tissue as well. You are talking that uh, you want to try clinical trials in five to 10 years. So uh, I suppose that you have some results already with animal models. Um, could you talk about that? What the, the recent uh, results you have? Yeah, the results we have um, so far, uh, at least the ones we've published, are echo what many groups in the field have shown also. Uh, the, and by the field, I mean of, of brain cell transplants or organoid transplants. Um, and that is um, a really remarkable ability for new neurons to integrate with the adult brain. Um, this is uh, very important to us. It was a surprise to the field uh, that they do this, but it's been reproduced now by dozens of labs. It's a very robust uh, finding. Um, so that's really good. And uh, we, we also showed, and maybe one other group, that if you put in vascular endothelial cells, so the cells that make blood vessels, they will also form vessels in your transplant that fuse with the host to circulate blood. So you get vascular integration and you get um, neuronal integration with the brain. So that all sounds really good, um, but the transplant tissue is still not functional because What's being put in is a um, sort of a mix or a mess of cells. There's no organization to those cells um, to form a normal tissue. And, and there's also missing cell types. So what we're doing uh, primarily in the company, also a little bit of the basic research still in the lab, and what I find uh, exciting is um, identifying what the missing components are, both structural and cell type. And at this point, we know what they are. And so we just have to uh, put them together so that the tissue that develops from our precursor cell transplants is a tissue that is organized well enough to process information. And uh, the idea is to use uh human cells, right? Uh, not from donors, but uh, lab-grown cells, right? Ideally, we'd want to use, you know, your cells for you, Nina, your cells for you, Nicholas, my cells for me. And that's the direction we want to go in. Uh, but initially, even for clinical trials in patients, it is prohibitively expensive and difficult to do that. But that's what people are doing now in clinical trials for Parkinson's by putting dopaminergic neurons to replace the dopaminergic neurons that are lost. Uh, they're using allogeneic, so not patient-derived. So the patients have to take immune suppressants for a while to ensure that those cells uh, stay alive in the brain and are not rejected by the host. So our first clinical trials will involve more than likely immune suppression um, as well. I suppose that before you go to the clinic, you have to, to have some results with uh, animals. So do you have a timeline for animal trials? Yes, yes. So that's uh, years three and four is when we're uh, planning those. 
uh, in mice. And, you know, the technology for testing and monitoring brain function in mice has become um, very sophisticated. Uh, so we have a setup where we can uh, monitor the activity of our graph neurons. Let's say we put them in the visual cortex of a mouse, so back here. Uh, and the mouse has, you know, uh, really separated binocular vision. So there isn't much uh, overlap in the visual fields from the two eyes because they're on the side of the head. So we can expose the mouse to uh, visual stimuli independently for each eye. And the mouse can learn a behavior based on that. So as their head fixed, so we have like a microscope looking into their brain, literally, we can teach the mouse a task to, for a particular visual input, to lick a spout, a reward. And if it licks when there is no proper stimuli, then there's a lag. It gets penalized and there's no reward for a while. So it learns, it can be quite good. I mean, not all mice. There's clearly some mice are smarter than others, but uh, mice, some mice will learn very well the visual task. And so we can use that to demonstrate that our graft, so once it's learned the task, we can lesion the visual cortex so that mice cannot see anymore. We can put in our graft, and if our graft is working, then the mouse should reacquire the behavior and be able to perform it. Not only that, but we can modify the neurons in the graft to be able to control their activity uh, using what's called optogenetics. So just by shining a particular wavelength, we can silence our graft neurons transiently and show that the mouse can't perform the behavior anymore and then remove the light from the uh, silencing of the graft and then show that the mouse can perform the behavior again. If we can do that in mice, then I think we can go straight to the FDA and say we don't really need to show this in a you know, bigger animal. It could be that it won't work in mice and that we'll have to test it in uh, a primate, but hopefully we won't. And that would add, you know, two, three years before we can go to the FDA. Uh, if the FDA requires us to show that it works in terms of getting it into people and trying it in people, um, it, it might, I'm not sure what the, what the bar will be. Yet. And that's why we're going to enter discussions with them as soon as we can. Thank you so much for, for your time. Your research is really interesting uh, and it's very like futuristic, like the things you're talking about, the microscope, it's, uh, I don't know, it makes me very exciting. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jan. Uh, and until the, the next time. Yeah, thank you both. Yeah, Nicholas, uh, pleasure to be talking to you again. I look forward to doing it again sometime.